Hello, and welcome to this uh, remote online virtual uh, book signing with the great Dr. Norman Rosenthal. My name is Bob Roth. And for the next hour, we're going to have an extraordinary experience, all of us talking to an individual who I believe is a rare soul in this world. There's a definition in the ancient meditation text that describes uh, an enlightened person as a person who has a cool mind and a warm heart. And Norman is clear, crystal clear, as you'll see, but he also has a warm and embracing heart. Norman Rosenthal is a world-renowned psychiatrist, researcher, and best-selling author who first described seasonal affective disorder, SAD, and pioneered the use of light therapy as a treatment during his 20 years at the National Institutes of Mental Health. He's currently professor of psychiatry at Georgetown University School of Medicine, He's written or co-authored over 20 scholarly articles and 10 popular books, including the New York Times bestseller, Transcendence, Healing and Transformation Through Transcendental Meditation, and the national bestseller, Supermind. As I said, we're here to discuss his most recent book, Poetry Rx, how 50 inspiring poems can heal and bring joy to your life. So I'd like to welcome everyone. And I'd like to welcome you, Dr. Rosenthal. And, but before we start speaking with you, I'd like to, your, his book, uh, Poetry Rx, is getting some extraordinary reviews. Many of you may know Jane Brody. She's a prominent health uh, columnist with the New York Times for decades. And she writes of Norman's book, Poems, I Now Realize, thanks to Dr. Rosenthal, can be a literary panacea for the pandemic. They let us know that we are not alone that others before us, before us have survived devastating loss and desolation, and that we can be uplifted by the imagery and cadence of the written and spoken word. We have so many questions, and if you would like to ask a question for Dr. Rosenthal, you can go to the chat box on your, uh, at the bottom of Zoom, and we'll get to as many of them as we can. But before we start with you, Dr. Rosenthal, um, I'd like to show a short video that your friend and a uh, friend of a lot of people, uh, Katie Finnerman, a, a video she made of you about the book and she reads a poem. And Katie is a two-time Tony Award-winning actress who's currently working with director Julian Fellows on a TV series about the Gilded Age. So this is what Katie has to say about Poetry Rx. Even though Katie is Norman close. Rosenthal is a, is a beautiful, beautiful close friend of mine. And a couple of years ago, he told me about his idea for this book and that he was beginning to work on it. And I was very encouraging. But I knew in my heart, little place in my heart, that poetry has never been something that I've turned to for comfort. Um, intellectually, I could understand it, but it never really spoke to me. I just couldn't feel it the way that I knew that I was supposed to. So when he sent me an advanced copy, I began to read it and then reading how he relates it to people that are struggling. Um, at 50, all of a sudden I'm, I'm saying poetry in a whole new way. Um, it's like opening a door to a bunch of new friends. This is one art by Elizabeth Bishop. The art of losing isn't hard to master. So many things seem filled with the intent to be lost that their loss is no disaster. Lose something every day, accept the fluster of lost door keys, the hour badly spent. The art of losing isn't hard to master. Then practice losing farther, losing faster. Places and names and where it was you meant to travel. None of these things will bring disaster. I lost my mother's watch. And look, my last, next to last, the three loved houses went. The art of losing isn't hard to master. I lost two cities, lovely ones, and vaster some realms I owned, two rivers, a continent. I miss them, but it wasn't a disaster. Even losing you, a joking voice, 
a gesture I love. I shouldn't have lied. It's evident the art of losing's not too hard to master, though it may look like, write it like disaster. Thank you for that, Katie, virtually for that beautiful, your beautiful comments and that reading of that poem. Dr. Rosenthal, welcome. Thank you. And the extraordinary book, uh, Poetry Rx. Out of 50, out of countless poems, you selected 50. And out of those 50, you selected this one, One Art, as your first poem. Why? Really, One Art was the entry point into my adventure that became Poetry Rx. Uh, a friend of mine called me late one night telling me that he had lost somebody very dear to him. And I was wondering what to say to him that didn't come across as a cliche or an empty statement, such as we often are tempted to say when somebody tells you something like that. And knowing that he was a person steeped in the arts, I said to him, you know, losing is an art. And like any art, it can be developed. And I heard something in his voice as he said, do you know that poem? I said, like, what poem? And this is the poem he read to me, reading through it. And by the time he had finished reading this poem, I could hear his voice lift. There was a sense of relief. And I felt it too. And I thought, wow, can a poem really make a person who's grieving feel better? And so I started looking for other poems that had this capacity, not just to alleviate grief, but to um, improve uh, mood, to help people who are in love or out of love and in all kinds of situations, asked people, asked patients, did any poem ever do that for you? And before I knew it, I had a, quite a collection on my hands. But, beautiful, but what is it about a poem? What is it about those words, those particular words those, that, that can do that, that wouldn't just happen if a person just talked to you about, oh, feel better or something? What is it about poetry? And is there research on what happens in the brain? Well, imagine asking that same question in relation to the visual arts. If you look at a Picasso or a Van Gogh or more modern times, a Rothko, um, what is it about the way they've put the paint on the canvas that captures you and moves you and makes you feel something that you wouldn't feel if it was just, you know, paint sloshed on the canvas? That's how it is with words that have been beautifully placed on a page so that they create a sound and a sentiment and an idea that is so unusual and unique and refreshing that it has this capacity. And to answer your second question, yes, they have had people listen to poems and they've hooked them up on all kinds of physiological devices and imaged them. And what they find is that there are goosebumps, there are chills, and the reward circuitry of the brain comes alive and gets activated when they listen to poetry. So I have a friend who just texted me, John, who said he's on this uh, webinar, this Zoom call, because he loves poetry. But there are people who never got poetry. And I think the story about Jane Brody, the New York Times columnist, not to elevate her or anyway, but just to tell that story, because she never liked poetry until she read your book. Would you tell that story? I thought, found it very fascinating. Yeah, I don't know if anybody in the audience doesn't know Jane Brody, but she has been writing columns for the New York Times for 40 years, Personal Health, it's called. And I personally love her columns. I think she's just brilliant. She's interviewed me a few times in the past. So I approached her with this idea. And the first thing she said was, I don't like poetry. <laughs> I thought, well, that's not a very promising beginning. But 
you know, to her huge credit, she was just open. She was open to receiving the PDF of the book. And then she said, you know, there's something here. She checked in with a 94 year old friend of hers who loved poetry and the older friend said, you know, your husband was a lyricist, you know, poetry is just lyrics. And um, as she read, she changed her mind to her huge credit, because I think it's hard to change one's mind if you've set in your ways. And she wasn't. She did change her mind. And she said as much in her article. And to me, to have somebody whom I respect that highly change her mind about this topic that I hold dear and had hoped would have this function in Poetry Rx, this function to change people's minds was a huge validating experience for me. Now, is there a poem that you might give to someone who's experienced a breakup? Is, is there a particular, I mean, in other words, do you prescribe poetry like you might prescribe a medicine? Well, indeed, if somebody had told me that he or she had had a breakup, I might easily uh, read to them uh, Derek Walcott's Love After Love. Derek Walcott is a Nobel Prize winning poet from the Caribbean, and here is his poem. The time will come when, with elation, you will greet yourself arriving at your own door, in your own mirror, and each will smile at the other's welcome and say, sit here, eat. You will love again the stranger who was yourself. Give wine, give bread, give back your heart to itself, to the stranger who has loved you all your life, whom you ignored for another, who knows you by heart. Take down the love letters from the bookshelf, the photographs, the desperate notes, peel your own image from the mirror, sit, feast on your life. Beautiful. Uh, explain a little bit about the structure of the book, because I, it's not just a book that has 50 poems, but you comment on it. I, explain how, how you set this up. And I think that's what Jane Brody and myself and others found, you know, I might have described myself in the past as not that familiar with poetry in the last year or so, I've sort of dived into it. But tell me about, tell us how you set up the, the book. Well, it was a structure that evolved as I was thinking about it. it. I was clear that the poem should come first. People should approach a poem, if possible, uh, with a blank slate, a beginner's mind, have a fresh look at it. Then I would say what I thought the poem meant. That's the kind of value add for people who find the poem difficult or distant or hard to really apprehend. So I, I have a short piece that tells them why I think this poem is interesting and what is interesting to me about it, um, including stories that I have encountered in my work clinically or in my life. And then I would give them the takeaways. Um, you know, the one, two, three are what you can learn from this poem. And finally, I would end with a little biographical note about the poet showing how the poet and the poem fit together almost like pieces of a jigsaw puzzle. Was so it hard to write process. this book? Was it hard to write this book or did it sort of flow? You know, some, sometimes you write something and it's a lot of work. Was, it, was this a labor of love? Was there, or was, was it challenging? You know, I thought about it for so long and I made attempts to start it for so long so that when I actually got around to writing it, I had evolved quite an advanced idea. So then it, once I got the structure, once I had the poems, then it flowed. But writing it was one thing and getting it published was another. It was turned away by at least three agents. It may have been four. I kind of try to put it out of my mind. <laughs> um, so three agents and two editors from publishers that had published my work in the past. And they said, you know, Poem that poetry doesn't sell. So I was ready to self publish. I thought if I can just get it into a thousand people's hands, 
and give them the joy that I have had and the help that I have received from these poems, I would be satisfied. And at that stage, through a contact with a friend, I was connected with a small publisher. I call it the little publisher that could uh, after that children's book, the, uh, the little engine that could. In any event, it, it has proven to be a very happy alliance and they've done a lovely job of putting it together. And uh, so here we are. And that's G&D Media, what is the name? G&D Media is the name of the G&D Media. Mm -hmm. Before we go on, I wanna say that um, Norman's book, Poetry Rx, if you want to purchase it, um, you can get 10% off when you purchase the book from Politics and Prose, it's right there. And you enter the coupon, so it says, but the Zoom, Zoom chat in the Zoom chat window, if you enter the coupon code SPECIAL10, you'll get 10% off. And there's two reasons why I think, it's, I think it's wonderful to support politics and prose based in Washington, DC, an extraordinary uh, independent publisher, I mean, book bookseller. And also uh, Norman is donating, we'll talk more about this, 100% of his profits from the sale of this book tonight um, to the David Lynch Foundation, actually to a program to bring help to veterans and their families who suffer from post-traumatic stress. And I do want to get back to, you have a poem in here about post-traumatic stress, but I, I, I have a, a question from John. Do you remember the first poem that you wrote and why did you write it? Well, um, I- A simple no is fine too. <laughs> I, I've tried to forget the first poem I wrote. And uh, I think I will spare the audience uh, my amateurish efforts, but it's well, a great question. No, you actually have written, I've seen some of your poetry. Here's another question. Are you familiar with the National Association for Poetry Therapy? And what are your suggestions for getting more poetry therapists employed to do this deeply healing work? You know, I don't know that organization. I know a lot of people have encouraged uh, patients to write their own poems. And I think that's a wonderful thing to do. But my own approach here has been a little different. It's been what can you get out of pre-existing poems that are these ingenious gems that we have sitting there waiting for our attention. And the other sphere, which is actually writing poems, is not one that I'm really steeped in. But there is research showing that journaling and writing poetry and those things can be very beneficial. And again, that is the National Association for Poetry Therapy for those who are interested. Uh, another question, um, how might you use a poem in, your, uh, in a session with a patient? Well, let's, let's take an example over here of a poem by Rumi. Let's say that somebody came into my office, let's say a couple came into my office and were squabbling. He said she did this, she said he did that, they are at loggerheads with each other and they turn to me almost as two litigants would turn towards a judge and say, who's right, who's wrong, uh, you know, issue a verdict and execute a sentence. And I say, you know, I'm not a judge. Um, I'm really not here to adjudicate or litigate or back anybody. I'm here to help the two of you come together. After all, you loved each other enough to get married and you've had children together and you've built a life together. So something must have pulled you together somewhere along the way and that's kind of been lost track of. Uh, why don't we look at a poem by Rumi? And so I would say, here, here goes. Out beyond ideas of wrongdoing and right doing, there is a field. I'll meet you there. When the soul lies down in that grass, the world is too full to talk about. Ideas, language, even the phrase each other doesn't make any sense. And somehow just infusing into the session this great poem by a great poet who wrote hundreds and hundreds of years ago, beautifully translated by Coleman Barks. It gives them pause. 
because what the poet is really saying is let's look beyond wrongdoing and right doing. Let's put those things aside. They're actually distracting us from lying down together in a field. And the poet makes the first gesture, I'll meet you there. And that in couple therapy is called a repair attempt. The poet is, the poet is trying to model for them how one person has to be the first one to say, come on, shake hands, give me a hug, give me a kiss, whatever it is to say, we can sort this out. And then once you change the state of being from one of squabble to one of lying down in a field, then ideas, language, these things seem to take a second place. So that is how by bringing another conversation into the squabble, you can distract and amplify the good things in this relationship. Hmm. You wrote a book called Transcendence about transcendental meditation. And you, I think, cite some poems. M many poets throughout time have talked about transcendence and experiences of transcendent experiences that um, transcend even meditation. Mm -hmm. Could you talk about transcendence and poetry? Well, one poet that comes to mind is actually called a transcendental poet is William Wordsworth. And there are two poems in my collection by Wordsworth that are, in my view, absolutely fantastic. I had so underappreciated them. The one is daffodils, which a lot of people learn uh, in school because it is an apparently very simple poem, but it incorporates and engenders a sense of what we now know as transcendence. The sense of your consciousness moving into another space in your mind, the mind within the mind, as it is said um, in the sacred writings, the mind within the mind, the mind beyond the mind, dwell there, the um, sacred text tells us. And what does that mean? What does that mean, the mind within the mind? Well, it means that, that there is within consciousness other forms of consciousness that are not necessarily accessed in daily life. But if you have what William James calls the requisite stimulus, he acknowledges William James in his great work, Varieties of Religious Experience. He acknowledges that there are many forms of consciousness outside of our daily lives. This is not some uh, fly by night. This is the father of psychology, so he's called. And he acknowledges that just apply the requisite stimulants, stimulus and at a touch, there it is. And that is what happens, for example, when we do transcendental meditation. We have a mantra, we taught how to use the mantra and at a touch, there we are, we go into this mind within the mind. And that's the kind of feeling that William Wordsworth engenders when he says, I wandered lonely as a cloud. Already you're feeling that floating feeling that floats on high or veils and hills. So you get that sort of pleasant feeling. And then it suddenly it becomes vibrant when all at once I saw a crowd, a host of golden daffodils. I won't regale you with the entire poem, but you see a kind of variability in that state of consciousness between the floaty transcendent and the vibrant fluttering of words and images. And that is characteristic of the transcendent state of consciousness. So there we have it. And a second poem also elaborates on other aspects of transcendence in uh, the view of Tintern Abbey mm. uh, by, by Wordsworth. Fantastic poems. And I discuss them in the light of how they enhance our experience of consciousness. Here's another question said, uh, uh, some great writers I've encountered like Harold Bloom at Yale say you cannot really connect fully with a poem unless you take the time to memorize it. Do you agree? Well, I think it's very lucky for Harold Bloom that he has such an excellent memory. <laughs> I don't think everybody does. Uh, and I think you can get a great deal out of a poem without memorizing it. That said, there is something about memorizing a poem that puts it right there for you to get at any moment. 
And there's a great joy in thinking back, especially of a poem memorized when you're very young and thinking back and the whole thing comes, comes out um, and it, it can be a lovely experience, but I don't want to saddle people with the feeling that they need to do that in order to get a benefit from the poem. Okay, I don't want to put you on the spot, but can you remember a, a poem that you memorized when you were very young? I can. It was given to me as a punishment. <laughs> I was doing something in the history class that I shouldn't have been doing. <laughs> I can't remember what it was. And the... Uh, the history teacher, who later became a good friend, um, said, memorize sonnet number 18 of William Shakespeare. And I never encountered a sonnet, but I found an old book of Shakespeare's complete works. And then, shall I compare thee to a summer's day? Thou art more lovely and more temperate. Rough winds do shake the darling buds of May and summer's lease hath all too short a date. Sometime too hot the eye of heaven shines, and often is his gold complexion dimmed, and every fair from fair sometime declines, by chance or nature's changing course untrimmed. But thou eternal, but thou eternal summer shall not change, nor lose possession of the fair thou owest, nor shall death brag thou wanderst in his shade when in eternal lines to time thou growest. As long as men can breathe and eyes can see, so long lives this, and this gives life to thee. It was a worthwhile punishment. Well, I came to him and I said, here's, I've memorized it. Do you want to hear it? He said, oh, no, I'm not interested. In it. Yeah. <laughs> okay, another, another, uh, Que another question. The principle in poetry therapy essentially means that sometimes, not always, when a person is grieving or depressed, etc., it's helpful to actually read a sad poem. Again, not always, but your thoughts? I think that's right on the money because, you know, we th you're not going to want to read a jolly poem that says, you know, cheer up, things could be worse, whatever, whatever. No, you want to know that others have suffered too, that you're not alone, that this is a well-known experience that is almost universal, and others have dealt with it. Some have dealt with it by writing, some have dealt with it by crying. There are many ways to deal with grief, and poetry is one, and it can be very, very comforting. Um, one of the poems in my collection is by Edna St. Vincent Millay, who says, who starts one sonnet saying, time has not brought relief. You lied who told me time would ease me of my pain. And she goes on to say, I still grieve every moment, every season, every day. And I plucked it out of a book by a colleague of mine where she describes how she thought of that sonnet when she was grieving. It can be a great uh, comfort to know others have felt and have trodden where you have trodden. Here's a comment from Linda Sittenfeld. Uh, Dr. Rosenthal, you are just as inspirational and pioneering as when we did TV together on SAD, Seasonal Affective Disorder in the 80s. I look forward to reading this book. Um, again, Mike, if you could put this up, I do want to, those of you who are just joining now, uh, we are with Dr. Norman Rosenthal, that you know, who's written a new uh, amazing book, Poetry Rx, How 50 Inspiring Poems Can Heal and Bring Joy to Your Life. And to get a signed copy and 10% off, we want to do that through uh, Politics and Prose Bookstore, based in Washington, D.C., that we all love. And you can click at the, in your chat box on your Zoom and uh, enter special 10 and you'll get 10% off and then you'll get a, Dr. Rosenthal has signed the book. So you'll have that. So I just wanna call your attention to that again. Um, a few more questions and then I wanna talk about, uh, here's one, I wanna talk about the benefit that you're doing. I, I love the fact that you've written this book on poetry and you, in, you include a poem on post-traumatic stress disorder and that you are donating your proceeds 
from the sale of this book tonight to help veterans with post-traumatic stress. But here's a question. Who are some of your favorite poets? Do you have any poems by Amanda Gorman in your book, the young woman who uh, thrilled the nation on the inauguration day? Who are some of your favorite poets and do you have any poems from Amanda Gorman? And we have a lot of questions coming in, Norm, so we have to go. Let's start with the second one. No, I don't have anything by Amanda Gorman. I didn't even know about her existence when I wrote the poem, but I'm so happy to know it now. She certainly galvanized us during the recent inauguration. My favorite poem, poets, Shakespeare, Emily Dickinson, uh, Rumi, um, Cavafy, um, Salvador Quasimodo, um, and on and on. They are all there in the, in the book. My very, very favorite, Elizabeth Bishop, Elizabeth Barrett Browning, I can go on and on. It's like asking who your favorite child is as if you've got 50 children, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so um, here's an is there a type form of poetry that is particularly helpful, transcendent, therapeutic, blank verse versus rhymed, haiku, sonnet, etc.? <clears throat> I have used mostly verses that have a form there's something about the musicality of a form that to me is extremely moving. I've got three villanelles. They have a special form that's complex. They have an alternating rhyme scheme. Certain sentences are repeated at prescribed intervals. They're really beautiful. I have a lot of sonnets there, but I have some non-rhyming verse there as well. So, you, you know, Things can be beautiful in many different ways and helpful. For those of you who are joining, um, just to repeat part of the bio, bio of Dr. Rosenthal, Dr. Rosenthal is a world-renowned psychiatrist, researcher, and best-selling author who described, first described seasonal affective disorder, SAD, and pioneered the use of light therapy as a treatment during his 20 years at the National Institutes of Health. He's currently professor of psychiatry at Georgetown University School of Medicine. Another question. Is it more effective? Is it more effective in terms of therapy to read a poem aloud? Reading a poem aloud is a wonderful thing to do. I would say read it to yourself, read it aloud, listen to it being read by sometimes the poet herself or himself or by some great reader of poetry. Um, my book will be available very shortly in audible form, and I can't wait to listen to it because it will be a different experience for me than to have written it or spoken it aloud. So you're not recording it to yourself, someone else? No, is there are a couple of wonderful voice actors that they have found a husband and wife team that will take the role of the male and female poets. Great. So um, yes, uh, so it's a wonderful thing to do, to read it aloud because you get the, the phonic elements of the poem. Now you wrote a book called The Gift of Adversity and here's a question, can poetry help us understand the gift of adversity? You yes, can do a little can. backstory there and then you can answer the question. Yes, the backstory is that I wrote a book about lessons that nobody had ever taught me that I had learned through my own experiences. And what I realized was that most of the time, I learned the most when things went wrong. Setbacks, adversities, mistakes that I had made. And so I called it the gift of adversity. And I think poetry can help because poetry is empathic. Uh, people who write poems uh, are fallible people. Uh, and, and you'll see a lot of that in the in the bios of the poets, many of whom suffered from depression and other psychological distress. These people did not have easy lives and yet they took their lives and they made something of it. Think of that first poem, The Art of Losing, One Art. Look at all the things she lost. Look at all of her setbacks and mistakes she made, the fluster of lost door keys, the hour badly spent. You learn something from even the smallest adversity teaches you something, let alone losing somebody dear to you. So I think uh, poetry is a wonderful anodyne to the gift to adversity. It is the gift of adversity. Anodyne means for those who don't Pain know. Painkiller. Painkiller, great. 
What are some steps towards memorizing a poem? Well, I think it's like memorizing anything else. Um, first, memorize two lines. Then cover them up and see if you can remember. Well, maybe you can't, then do it again. Once you've got the two lines, do another two lines. And before you know it, if it's just a sonnet, that's 14 lines, you've memorized the whole thing. Then say it all to yourself and see how nice it feels. Maybe you made two or three mistakes and then come back. And then the process of memorizing it can become a challenge. Can I do it? 14 lines, let me give it a shot. I bet you most of the people watching can do it. I mean, we're not talking about Paradise Lost. We're talking about something short and rhyming and with a, a regular meter. Most of these sonnets have got the iambic pentameter. That's da 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 da. That sounds like the heartbeat. The human heartbeat goes lub dup lub dup lub dup lub dup lub dup. So the meter that is most common. You think that's not a coincidence? I don't think so. I think it's intuitively. Uh, sort of programmed into us, that, that rhythm. Do you recommend to read the poems in the order that they appear in a book? Or would you recommend the reader to read by selecting the poems of their interest? You know, I would hate it if somebody told me how to read a book because I often just turn to the middle of the book right away. And uh, I look through the contents and I say, oh, that one looks interesting. I'm undisciplined that way. And the nice thing about this book is you can read it from start to finish, or you can read it, you can pick and choose. Um, I think one of the good, one of the reasons to start at the beginning is the introduction tells you how to get the most out of a poem. So I think if you read the introduction first, you will then enjoy all the, other, all the other poems more. The other thing is I've started with loving and losing because they're so popular. They're such popular subjects. I've gone on to responses to nature, aspects of the human condition, a design for living and the search for meaning, which is a more mature topic. And the last section is aging and moving towards your final years of life. So it's got a kind of a natural, sequence to it. But I would say, just enjoy it, get something out of it, and that'll make me very happy. Okay, Norman, when you were at the National Institutes of Mental Health for 20 years, and you were doing your research on seasonal affective disorder, did you ever imagine? I no, if you can see that. No, I tell, never. Tell us, tell us the, the, the story, the arc, the narrative that went from that to today. I always wanted to be. And you a just doctor. have six hours. <laughs> I always wanted to be a doctor, a psychiatrist, a researcher, and a writer. And I had to postpone my writing career until I had done the other things. That was just the logical sequence. But the deepening of a writer, the deepening of my ability to write, has come about since I started to meditate. The meditation has given me the space in my mind in which ideas come together, like the pieces of a Rubik cube or jigsaw puzzle, it comes together and it has enabled me to write more than I ever imagined. And every time I think I've written my last book, some new idea pops up, usually while I'm meditating or maybe while I'm walking. And then the idea just kind of seems to grow. And I've learned to trust myself to let the organic process unfold. So I never would have imagined this book back then. It was, it was developed over time. And when you, when, when you talk about meditation in your own life, you talk, I mean, most people think of meditation as calming, relaxing, getting rid of stress, finding equanimity. When I've listened to you, you talk a little bit about that, but for you, it's much more of a mental uh, process, a, a mental awakening. You wanna talk about that? Yeah, my, my meditations are so varied and they're so wonderful really because they can be deeply restful and they can be extremely invigorating and they can facilitate creative problem solving and they do so time after time. So I get all those things and, and I would never, I, you know, I think of David Lynch 
who says, I've never missed a meditation. He says, why would I? And it brings, it really brings to life that if something is giving you that much twice a day, you're going to want to do it. So let's talk a little bit and then we'll have some more questions, but a little bit about that you're, you know, you're donating the profits of this event to help veterans with post-traumatic stress, uh, wounded warriors, uh, get trained to learn to meditate for free, transcendental meditation. What's your particular interest in that connection? It began really when I was running a clinical research organization. Mostly we were doing drug studies and other kind of very conventional studies, but I've always been attracted to the unconventional. And so I did get a grant with the freedom to do what I wanted with it. And it occurred to me that post-traumatic stress disorder with its flashbacks and its hyperarousal and its jumpiness and its easy startle response, that that might respond very well to a technique that settles down the nervous system. So we recruited uh, a small number of veterans from Iraq and Afghanistan with really <clears throat> horrible stories of stuff that had happened to them and very severe symptoms. And I saw some of these turn their lives around. And I could give you stories, but I won't, we don't have the time. But it was very moving to me, firstly, to see the extent of their suffering, and secondly, to see the magnitude of the impact of this very simple, harmless technique. So that got published and maybe that inspired uh, us to do that other study. We had a, a three centers, a three arm study, now a controlled study in the San Diego VA, together with many colleagues in the TM world, that too many to uh, mention, except perhaps for Tom Rutledge, who was the senior author on that study, and Sandy Nidich uh, were key players in that study. And we found that TM was no worse than the gold standard treatment. And it was a much easier, gentler treatment. So that was very, very promising. And that's now led to your spearheading uh, a multi-center study uh, with some of the top researchers on the subject in the country. And I'm really thrilled to be a part of that. But moving away from the research for a moment, I, it's not just a scientific interest to me, it's a personal interest to me. And I remember somebody who became a very dear friend. His name was Jerry Yellen. Mm. And I've just got a note or two here about him. I don't want <clears throat> to forget anything, but basically he had been a fighter pilot in Japan in the Second World War. He'd been on 19 missions over Japan with 11 other young pilots, all of them friends who never came home. And here's how he describes the 30 years after returning from the war. Life was empty. I had absolutely no connection to my relatives or my friends. I wasn't interested in going to college, even though it was free with a GI Bill. I was depressed, unhappy, and lonely, even though surrounded by my family. And that's how he was uh, initially uh, for 30 years after coming back from the war. So now, so, so what you're seeing here is not an over aroused picture. It's a shut down picture. He was shut down. And I'm going to now read a poem, The Sentence by Anna Akhmatova, the great Russian poet who was traumatized for years under the Stalinist regime. So here goes. This one's for you, Jerry. The Sentence by Anna Akhmatova. And the stone word fell on my still living breast. Never mind, I was ready. I will manage somehow. Today, I have so much to do. I must kill memory once and for all. I must turn my soul to stone. I must learn to live again. Unless summer's ardent rustling is like a festival outside my window, for a long time, I've foreseen this. Brilliant day, deserted house. Fortunately, Jerry's story has a happy ending. In 1975, he learned 
Transcendental Meditation, and here's how he describes its effects. It was the beginning of a huge metamorphosis in my life. After a few weeks of twice daily meditation, my attitude towards myself began to change. My anger and restlessness began to dissipate and a calmness I had never known before became apparent, not only to me, but to my family as well. I found a direction that had been missing in my life. So uh, that is uh, a poem, an Akhmatova's poem, the sentence, uh, had be, is included in my, um, in my book, along with a short bio of hers. I do mention Jerry with his, uh, with his own book, The Resilient Warrior. And uh, so I am so happy to have the occasion to bring that very brave man to mind. Beautiful, Norman. Thank you very much. Um, we have a few minutes left. <clears throat> We're gonna end with a, another video from the wonderful Katie Finneran, uh, where she records Hope, the Thing with Feathers with, um, by Emily Dickinson. So here's a question. You're a well-known writer. You have a wide group of followers and fans. Do you think this book will interest the same audience? I have ceased trying to predict. I <laughs> hope so. Maybe it won't. Maybe it'll interest a new audience. I just hope it interests people because my mission in life has really been to help people through my clinical work, through my research and through my writing. And if I can do that, uh, I feel like I've done what I can with the wonderful things that I've been given, so. So let's go to Katie Finneran and then we'll wrap up with some final comments. This is Hope by Emily Dickinson. Hope is the thing with feathers that perches in the soul and sings the tune without the words and never stops at all. And sweetest in the gale is heard and sore must be the storm that could abash the little bird that kept so many warm. I've heard it in the chillest land and on the strangest sea, yet never in extremity, it asked a crumb of me. Your comment on that? Uh, oh, I Norman? think her reading is so beautiful and it's so moving for me. I've heard it many times, I've read it many times, but. Her reading is so gorgeous, and uh, I am moved all over again. What is it about Emily Dickinson, from your perspective? That's she, I know it's sort of a trite question, but I'd love to hear your thoughts on Emily Dickinson. She's a genius. She's a genius. What she did with poetry was so novel. It's like what Picasso did with art, or, or you know, any analogous break. Her poems were short. They had a strange punctuation for the time. They had long M dashes. They had unusual capitalization. But when you read them with that unusual punctuation in mind, you see the difference. That sings the tune without the words and never stops, big dash, at all. So it never stops at all. The punctuation tells you, you've got to wait there. It's like so amazing. And she essentially, she wrote it for herself because she hardly ever got published in her own life. Yet at her death, her sister found 1800 poems on little pieces of paper and like little miniatures, uh, each one a gem. And, and you never get tired of them. You always see a new angle to them like my listening now to Katie's rendition her way of seeing it, her prosody, her choice of how to pause and ex emphasize various words. It was a joy all over. So her capacity to give you joy again and again is like looking at a Van Gogh or a Vermeer and enjoying it every time as though you're seeing it for the first time. So I'm gonna do a little reminder on the, uh, on the book, then we're gonna come back to you with final words, okay? 
So, um, Mike, if you could put that poster back up. So Norman is very kindly offered to donate 100% of his proceeds when we buy books through Politics and Prose, bookseller who's organized this evening's wonderful conversation. And you can go down to the, the link in the Zoom chat window. And if you type in special 10, you get 10% off. But more than that, it supports politics and prose. And more than that, it supports bringing meditation, transcendental meditation to veterans who are in dire, dire need of meditation. And the David Lynch Foundation, I should say, has brought meditation for free, transcendental meditation for free to over a million uh, children attending under-resourced schools in violent neighborhoods and war-torn neighborhoods for free all over the world, works with veterans and their families, works with women and children who are survivors of domestic violence and sexual assault, and now is working with nurses and doctors and other healthcare providers on the front lines of the COVID-19 pandemic. So thank you very much, uh, Dr. Rosenthal, and all of you who purchase, and you can get a signed copy of the book when you do it that way. So Norm, back to you, final, final thoughts. Well, my final thoughts is that an author doesn't just write a book and succeed. An author has many people to thank because it's a team effort. So first, Bob, I'd like to thank you for taking the time to engage in not just this conversation, but many, many conversations that we have every week. I'd like to thank Dean uh, for helping to organize it, Dean Drasner, my publicist, the publisher, as I said, the little publisher that could, GND Media, Mike Perez for taking your time to get this website up and running, uh, Eric Carter, my Carter Spurio, my web person, and Dan McQuaid, uh, who, as I say, is the glue and ink that pulls everything together. Thanks to everybody, and please, if I forgot anybody, uh, I guess the one entity I shouldn't forget is the readers who hopefully will enjoy the book. Thank you all very much for joining us tonight, and thank you, Dr. Rosenthal, for being that cool mind and a warm heart, writing all these books, and this book now in particular at such an important time, and uh, for being the mensch that you are. So. Um, I think Dr. Rosenthal will be doing this again through another uh, bookseller in a couple of weeks. So you can find out about that at normanrosenthal.com. We'll continue this conversation and everyone have a wonderful evening.